And though Colgan happened to be a regional airline, the lessons that we learned from that accident investigation apply to all carriers, regionals and mainline carriers alike. In fact, while the Colgan accident has generated significant interest and attention, it leads us to ask questions about is there something larger going on in the flight tech environment that deserves more scrutiny? Why are things like the sterile cockpit rule being routinely violated? What is happening to the professionalism and the judgment of flight crews? At least three non-fatal major carrier accidents deserve as much scrutiny as the Colgan crash. Take, for example, the runway excursion of Continental uh, Airlines Boeing 737 in Denver last December. The board's going to be considering our report on that accident next month, and so I'll have more to say on that after the board adopts its findings and recommendations. Or as another example, take the 2009 crash of the American Airlines flight um, in Jamaica. This was an aircraft that was arriving into heavy weather with significant tailwind. The airplane landed long and ran off the end of the runway, stopping just short of the beachhead and breaking into several parts. But this is not to say that everything's going in the wrong direction. Earlier this month, the Safety Board completed its report, findings, and recommendations on the Miracle on the Hudson accident. You will recall that shortly after they departed New York's LaGuardia Airplate, Airport, U.S. Airways Flight 1549 encountered a flock of Canada geese, and at least two geese were ingested into each engine, resulting in a complete loss of thrust. Captain Sullenberger and First Officer Skiles brought that aircraft down, ditching it into Hudson River, and all 150 passengers and five crew members evacuated safely. The media dubbed this accident the miracle on the Hudson. And indeed, our investigation revealed that the conditions that led to the ultimate success of this ditching were no less improbable than the conditions that caused the crash in the first place. Once the birds and the airplane collided, this accident became inevitable, but so many things went right. This is a great example of the professionalism of crew members, air traffic controllers, emergency responders, who all played a role in preserving the safety of everyone on board that aircraft. You know, much of our work at the NTSB involves looking back, looking back at accidents and incidents and asking, what if? What if the crew were trained and responded properly to the onset of the stall? What if the captain and the first officer kept a task and monitored their situational awareness? Would they have been able to identify that they lined up on the wrong runway? What if they had been forced to land on the river at night? Our recommendations look back to help us look forward so that we do not repeat these mistakes and that we avoid tragic consequences. But I also know that it's not enough to just look back. So allow me to share some thoughts about you, about what we can do looking forward. The NTSB realizes that a big part of the problem that you face is the slowness and the unpredictability of the regulatory process. The airline industry is constantly moving forward. You're adjusting to new, new technologies and adjusting to new economic realities. You should be able to look to the regulations for guidance on best practices, yet they fail time and time again to keep pace. The intense media scrutiny over the Colgan accident and tends to focus the attention of Congress, and as you know, following the accident, they responded with multiple legislative proposals in both the House and the Senate. These proposals, in effect, were intended to bypass the slow regulatory process by requiring things by statute. Both the House and the Senate have moved legislation that requires the FAA to improve the overall safety in the industry. Both bills call for the FAA to address fatigue or flight and duty time rules. 
to revise training programs for flight crews, and even to require minimum numbers of hours to qualify for certificates. Last week at our forum, I was disappointed to hear that once again, the NPRM for flight and duty time had been pushed back. We had originally heard May, we had originally heard January, then we heard May, now we're hearing September. And I think that what's so disappointing about this is that many of you all probably participated in that quick fuse arc. And what started out looking like a 200 yard dash now really looks like a steeplechase and it's turning into a slow process with no end in sight. The Safety Board has called on the FAA to adopt a number of initiatives for years. In fact, we're pleased to see that many of the elements in the bills stem from the Board's recommendations. Many of you are familiar with our Most Wanted list, and it identifies what we view as the safe, top safety priorities in the transportation industry. Flight and duty time has been on our most wanted list for years. Recommendations on our fatigue have occupied our most wanted list since its inception in 1990. That's over 20 years. And this year we added pilot proficiency to the list, focusing on records and remedial training. So while the focus of the Congress and their legislation is not identical to the focus of the NTSB, we're certainly glad to see that there's a sense of urgency to learn more from and improve upon past mistakes. But, and with the NTSB, there's always a but, even if the congressional legislation passes, the reality is, is that we're unlikely to see all of the changes that we're looking for or even rapid regulatory action. Part 121 may set the regulatory framework for commercial cargo and passenger uh, aviation, but I think we can all agree that it sets the bare minimum for safety standards. Each airline has a responsibility to go beyond the minimum. And the good news is that most of you are doing just that. And we're hearing about those success stories at forums and events like this and at our professionalism forum last week. Perhaps you need to use new methods to solve old problems. And pilot fatigue is, the top, is at the top of that list. As you know, fatigue affects people in all modes of transportation, 